Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone uh, hear me? Is the amplification loud enough? Thank you very much for coming. My name is Michael Small. I'm uh, the still newly arrived uh, uh, executive director of the program Carbon Talks and Renewable Cities at uh, Simon Fraser University's uh, Center for Dialogue. I'm normally based in the downtown campus. This is, in fact, my first time to be here on the mountain. So it's a pleasure to come up here and uh, for a special uh, Carbon Talk. Carbon Talk is a series of car Carbon Talks, has been a series of programs over the last uh, five years focusing on uh, a variety of issues, obviously relating to climate change related topics and, and cities. Uh, we would particularly like to thank our funders for the public carbon talks that we've done, the North Growth Foundation and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Today is a special edition uh, with a very specific focus, which I think everyone appreciates, the referendum that's uh, about to be launched on urban transit in the Lower Mainland. And it, it, this is an initiative, this particular carbon talk is an initiative with uh, another project of the center called Moving the Livable Region, which has been to help educate and put information out to the public and to interested citizens and voters about the issues at stake on uh, in transit related issues and the impact that has on uh, economies of cities and quality of life in cities. We have three speakers today for you. Um, each of them will speak for about 10 minutes. I'm going to introduce them extremely briefly. Uh, then we'll go to uh, questions and comments. This is meant to be a dialogue. Obviously, uh, if you've got questions that you want to put to the speakers in general or to one in particular, please say so. But if you have a comment as well, that's equally uh, very much part of the spirit of the event. We want to get hear a range of views and hear uh, the issues that are on people's minds. Uh, normally, if we had a walking mic, I would be walking around passing to the people. But A, we don't have a walking mic. And B, I can't walk very well at the moment, so uh, I think we'll just use that, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up to that uh, front mic if you've got a question, or if your voice is loud enough and you feel comfortable just uh, projecting, standing up and, and, and uh, projecting. Um, with that, uh, I think we'll now proceed to our, our speakers. I'll introduce them very briefly. The first one is uh, Benjamin Dawkus. He's a senior policy analyst at the C.D. Howe Institute. Uh, he specializes on a variety of topics, including municipal finance, transportation, tax, energy, environment, and labor policy. And I think for the purposes of today, most notably, he was the author of a report that was widely covered yesterday, released uh, by the C.D. Howe Institute and sponsored by Clean Energy Canada on the um, economic implications and costs of the issues at stake in the referendum. Our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Megan Winters uh, here at Simon Fraser University. She's an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and she's an epidemiologist interested in the link between health, transportation, and city design. And then finally, uh, reflecting the student uh, population of the university, Joshua Cairns, who's the transit team coordinator here at Sustainable SFU, and he's working uh, to improve transit mobility to and from Simon Fraser University. So with no further ado, I'll pass it over to Ben. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, heavy. So thanks so much for inviting me. But what I want to do here first is so, do something a little bit different, which is start with some audience participation. It's pretty simple. I want you to say hello to the person next to you. <laughs> say hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Great. So I've just, I've just made you all a new friend. So I, th I think I'd meet you all a new friend. What does this have to do with uh, congestion, right? Now, it all took you a little bit longer to get here because of congestion. That's, and we all know that that's one of the costs of congestion. But imagine if traffic had been a lot worse. Imagine that if th your new friend couldn't make it here because traffic was much worse. If that were the case, the person next to you would be a lot worse off because they didn't meet you, and I'm sure they're going to miss what's going to be an amazing panel. Um, but not only are they worse off, you're worse off as well. Because that benefit of getting that new friend doesn't happen because of congestion. But imagine that idea spread not only to this forum, but around the province where restaurants, sports stadiums, a lot of other th things where people come together don't happen because there aren't enough people to get there. That not only hurts the people who are going to go there, but aren't going now because of congestion, but the people who are still going to go there, no matter what the congestion. 
So that's why congestion has a wider economic cost and a wider effect across the region. So if there are three things I want you to remember from uh, at the end of my presentation, it's one, cities are built on these, this idea of wider economic benefits of sharing services, meeting in person, <coughs> and this idea of better job matching, being able to find a, a job more easily across the region. Same thing with your employer. Your employers are a lot better off by having access to a wider set of population. Uh, two, these are the uh, hidden costs of congestion. And what we've been talking about so far, what the Mayor's Council has been presenting, are really focused on that visible cost of congestion, of how much longer it takes you to make a trip. But that's based on you having decided that you were going to make that trip in the first place. And uh, the CDM study that, that we put out yesterday shows that those economic costs are between half a billion and up to $1.2 billion per year for Metro Vancouver. So be very, very, uh, very quickly, I'll go very quickly on what the Mayor's Council's plan is. Uh, the general point is it's planning to reduce congestion by 20%, uh, saving 20 to 30 minutes per person uh, on, in traffic and in travel time. That's going to mean less time stuck in traffic, uh, new and more frequent bus and rail services, uh, and new walking and cycling options. But what are the wider economic costs of congestion? Now, first it means people sitting in traffic, uh, wasting their time for sure. Uh, and that means that people are going to be sitting at home, maybe watching a cat video or something like that. Uh, and what are the results? The results are things like empty stadiums, empty restaurants. There's a guy who looks like he'd, ha he'd be having a lot more fun if there were a few more people around. Uh, students that don't have classmates. You have companies that can't find workers, and, need that they, and they can't find the people to do their jobs, and people who can't find the jobs in the first place. Congestion puts sand in the gears of urban economies. So wh what happens when we grease those gears and put in the good transit system? Well, first, you see a larger labor market, and that's going to benefit both firms and people. Uh, a larger labor market can better enable uh, a match of, an of a person's skills uh, and interests to the specific jobs and needs of an employer. That allows for a greater specialization. It's, it's akin to how people are better off in, in a factory or an office when they can have a specific job. A larger city allows more opportunities for specialization, and that makes workers more productive and richer. A second benefit is that larger labor markets uh, can reduce uh, the risks of both employees and firms, making them less dependent on their existing relationship, relationships to allow you to find a better job or an, empl an employer to find more workers that suit their needs. And remember that knowledge dissemination is much more effective in close proximity. Why are we even here? Why aren't we doing this by video conference? You're going to learn a lot more by being here in person, being able to ask a question in person than online. Same thing with university campuses. As the great economist Alfred Marshall put it, it's, like, it's akin to having ideas in the air. And that's a public good. Learning more and in less time means that you're going to have higher incomes eventually. Students learn better face-to-face -face than by themselves. But all these benefits only occur if people can reach a common work area or a common campus, like what we have here. Transportation infrastructure enables that. And lastly, cities also provide important cultural and consumer amenities, arts and sports venues, or restaurants, for example. Uh, those are the sorts of things that would otherwise not be accessible because of traffic congestion. And those extra customers that need transit or, or benefit from less congestion, maybe just enough to make sporting venues or that, or in that new restaurant viable. This is an example of how uh, benefits can be region-wide and the potential beneficiaries of new transportation very far away from the initial investment site. So what's the initial effect of uh, reduction in congestion? That's going to mean faster travel times for commuters, saving people a few minutes on their commute every day. So the economic question is, what are people going to do with the time saved? Well, the answer will be travel more. So remember, that when a person lives in an urban area, that person has a broader, uh, has an effect on other people uh, around them. And urban infrastructure, better urban infrastructure, enables more people in an area to connect than otherwise. And it's, that enhances that wider economic benefit that uh, I was just talking about. So for example, uh, someone who lives in South Vancouver or here in Burnaby is going to be, be able to benefit from an investment in New Westminster if that investment enables a connection that otherwise 
wouldn't have occurred. So they benefit from each other, even if they never meet. And this effect happens across the city, such as this overlap area on the boundary of Vancouver and Burnaby. Now imagine that idea happening across the region, where people from across the region are able to meet up in these um, more central areas that are allowed, that, that are enabled by better transportation infrastructure. So to calculate the economic benefits of this, uh, I just use a catch-all uh, estimate of the benefits of better urban access, the, the benefit of being surrounded by more and more people. So new transportation infrastructure and lower congestion allows those residents to access more of the city in the same amount of time. So congestion today means that you can fit in only three meetings in a day. But lower congestion would mean you could fit in four or five. So the magnitude of this kind of benefit uh, depends first on the strength of, uh, of interpersonal connections and second, on the geographical size of the region that benefits from an increased in enhanced accessibility. So from that I produce a low and high end range of the wider economic benefits. Uh, so the last, the last economic benefit I'll discuss is the benefit of being able to access a higher paying job. So that's going to uh, result in a higher income um, because you can get access a new job, but longer commute time means that people will incur a higher travel cost and inconvenience when commuting a longer distance. But remember that income's only one part of how people think about their well-being. <coughs> uh, that's what economists call their social welfare. Now, while commuters would benefit from uh, higher wages, if they were to switch to a uh, high-wage job requiring a long commute, that's going to mean greater travel discomfort and other, other costs they have to pay. But the bottom line is that uh, if you take these, all these benefits together, you're going to see a uh, potential upper end of, of economic benefits per person of between $400 uh, dollars per worker and $950 per worker, and total region-wide benefits of between half a billion dollars and $1.2 billion. And that has other side effects, uh, for, such as for federal and provincial revenues of uh, upwards of uh, 100, between $150 million and $360 million per year in increased government revenue, which is all part of uh, the cost-benefit analysis, which is what voters have in front of them. So with that, I'll close off. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I'd like to give the microphone. Working yes to uh, Dr. Winters, please. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for having me today. I wanted to start uh, with an introduction of myself. I've grown up in the Metro Vancouver region and lived here my whole life. I get around according to what's efficient for me. So I have two kids, we've got one car, my husband's a contractor, he drives all day. Um, I work at two different offices, we've got seven bikes. My transportation patterns are complicated. I make those decisions on what's easiest and most efficient. It's really hard to fit physical activity into my daily life, so where possible, I get around walking and cycling. Transit is the next best thing for me. So it depends who's with me. These improvements are meaningful to me because I'm going to benefit from the Beeline service on Hastings that connects these, the Vancouver Harbour Centre and Burnaby, like a lot of the students here are. Right now, that bus is slow and crowded. With more service, I'm going to be able to do my marking on the bus. I'm going to be able to be okay having the kids on the bus with me. Will and it change your marks? Will it change my marks? Well, Sorry. my students are used to a very scrawly <laughs> notes on there, so hopefully if it's smoother, they'll get less scrawl on the marks. And um, I think importantly, with the increased bus service, when I'm teaching a night, night class, I won't spend 30 minutes waiting for the next bus to come at the transit stop. Instead, I'll be able to get home in time to tuck people in. And so it's, it's meaningful to me. And that wasn't even mentioning sort of the more uh, rail lines, the Patello Bridge, the road network improvements. I think it's important to say there's improvements across the region. So um, what I found as I go around talking around the region is that it's important to put the context on here. What does our future look like? And a lot of people aren't aware that we're talking about you know, one million more people. So a third again, our population in the next 25 years. How are we gonna do that and hold true to our values keeping Metro Vancouver livable? We've been rated number one on the congestion index and the TomTom -tom index. That's not a reputation we want and that's current day conditions. So with a million more people, what's that our region gonna look like? I'm lucky that I can go on the board and tell you at the end of the day when I've looked at all the arguments on both sides, I think if we want to keep our region healthy, green and moving, we need this yes vote to go forward. And so I'm going to present um, pieces about what that health component is about. 
we've been introduced, I want to emphasize again that the improvements go across the region. There are big ticket items about the Broadway corridor, about the Patillo Bridge, but when I talk to the students and faculty and staff at SFU and in Burnaby, they talk about the regional connections. Now they can get from Langley to the SkyTrain and that can take them somewhere faster. I think it's important to point out that our chief medical health officers in Coastal Health and in Fraser Health have said that this is the most important public health decision of a generation. So it's not only about economics and transportation, but in fact our health benefits. Oh, you can't see the top of this, but it says transportation impacts health in so many ways. So health begins where we live, work, play, and learn. And I think it goes without saying that sitting in cars stuck in traffic with the road rage building inside you is not healthy. It's not healthy for the drivers themselves. It's not help healthy for their families. It's not healthy for the people who live on the roads where they're traveling or for the other road users. And in the next slides, I'm just gonna outline the, those health arguments um, for the, because that's the area of work that I, I specialize in. So our transportation um, patterns affect the air that we breathe. There are 680 deaths each year in Metro Vancouver that can be attributed to our air pollution levels and half our population lives within 250 meters of a major road, the exposure zone. The map that you see here is a map of soot for Metro Vancouver and you can see essentially it looks like our road network because that's what one of the major sources driving pollution levels are. Transportation and our travel patterns affect the safety of our streets. So my own work um, shows that each week in BC, six people who are drivers or passengers in motor vehicles die and over 400 are injured. This doesn't make headlines. Somehow we've accepted that this is um, uh, an acceptable level of danger, but um, it, it shouldn't be. And transit travel is far safer, carrying about one-tenth of the risk of driving in a motor vehicle. So there's impacts on road safety when we look at increasing or decreasing transportation. Uh, or vehicle kilometers traveled. Um, the, the truth is it's speed that kills here. So the chart at the bottom shows you that for pedestrians who are hit by a car traveling at 30 kilometers an hour, there's a 95% that they'll survive. For pedestrians who are hit at 60, 65 kilometers an hour, more like what we see across the major, major road network, there's a 15% chance of them surviving. So speed and the cars on the road have a major impact on traffic safety, which I would argue is already at an unacceptable public limit. Transportation patterns um, promote physical activity. People call public transit a, a stealth form of physical activity. It's one way that we incorporate it into our daily lives. The infographics on this in the next few slides were released um, early results from the My Health, My Community survey that was put on by <coughs> Coastal Health and Fraser Health, where they surveyed 28,000 Metro Vancouver residents. This is important local data, okay, local context data. Um, uh, so my own data shows that a transit trip brings nine minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So nine minutes of physical activity for kids, about five minutes for older adults. You can bet that you never see people run like they run for the bus when they're trying to catch it. <laughs> if nine or five minutes doesn't sound like a lough, that's per trip, per one-way trip. So there and back, 20 minutes, couple of transit trips a day maybe, and all of a sudden you can see how that walking accumulates. It doesn't take going to the gym, it doesn't take an extra program. So these are ways that we keep people healthy in their day-to-day -day activities. And it's been shown that those have higher rates of sustainability than, than personalized programming. So related to this physical activity benefit that we see, this also has impacts on downstream chronic disease and obesity levels. The My Health, My Community survey showing that people who use active modes of commuting have 33% lower odds of obesity, being obese or overweight. <coughs> Okay, so these are ways to keep at a population level to keep our population healthy. And I think Ben touched on the, the social and civic benefits. So what would you do with that extra 20 to 30 minutes a day? I'm sure we can think of better things to do than sitting in traffic. And it's almost a gift. So the local evidence highlights that people with longer commutes are less than half as likely to be involved or to have a strong sense of community. They're just not spending time there. The public health perspective would tell you that this is a critical decision for our most vulnerable populations. People who are dependent on trans uh, transit are especially those with lower incomes, those new immigrants to Canada, visible minorities and youth, people who can't already drive. This investment, they stand to both benefit the most from it. Although it does come at a cost to all of us at this 0.5% tax, the estimate for low income populations, 25,000 or less, is about 15 cents a day. So 
when I'm speaking to people, you know, you got to put the arguments. Everybody's coming from their own perspectives, and some people are always going to drive. So what do we tell those people who are drivers? I think there's a lot of reasons why they should be voting yes as well. They may never get out of their cars, but perhaps the people in the cars in the front of them would if there were good choices available. I've made the case about traffic safety being related to um, vehicle kilometers traveled. If there's less cars on the road, we've got less crashes. That has a health care benefit, also a time savings. Um, a lot of time is spent chauffeuring people around, so the TransLink trip diary indicates about 11% of trips are chauffeuring people around. Maybe there'll be other options, handy dart, bus services that mean that kids, older adults, people who need extra assistance can get around. Uh, time to relax. Sometimes it's nicer just to let other people drive. I would hate to be driving Hastings every day, and that beeline will really make my time more relaxed and saving money. So I think it's important to keep in mind what this vote is about. And this vote is about our future. It's not about the next four years, who's in government right now. This is about lasting investment in infrastructure that will shape the travel patterns of this region for the next 10 years and beyond for generations. It's a vote about reducing travel times, reducing congestion, protecting the environment, supporting the economy, and especially one for me about public safety and health. It's not about the details and nuances of transit. It's a higher at TransLink. It's a way that we're going to keep our region livable even as a million more people come. I would encourage you to take a look at the ballot if you haven't already. It's one thing that I find that when you give a little truth to somebody about what's in the plan, about what they're voting on here, that it can really change a, change a mind about what they're going for. So letting them know about the accountability that's put into that. It's now coming out all over the media, but three weeks ago, people didn't seem to be very aware of that. So annual reporting and accountability, that these dollars and cents go directly to the infrastructure investment. They're not about salaries or compass cards. And I guess my main point is to make sure, I talk a lot to students, to make sure they're registered to vote. That's, that's one of the big hurdles for them. I'm sure Josh will speak on it. And also to reach out to those people closest to you. Tell your roommates, tell your families, tell your friends. Once you've told five of them, tell five more of them. And so I think right now, just keeping in mind, framing it as it's time to vote on our region's future for their health and for the economy as well. Thank you very much. Directly to Joshua. Okay, so I'll start off by introducing myself a little bit as well. So my name is Joshua Cairns. I am the transit coordinator for Sustainable SFU. So I've been heading up most of our advocacy on campus, getting students uh, informed about the referendum, getting them out to vote. And then I'm also a Master of Resource Management candidate at SFU as well, where I research electric vehicles. Um, that's mainly done so that I can watch documentaries about Elon Musk all day as part of my research. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking, of course, that's more so because I'm interested in sustainable modes of transportation and that's kind of what leads me to this talk today as well. So a little bit about me and how I get around. Uh, I'm quite a multimodal commuter, so I commute from the city of North Vancouver to SFU every day. Uh, if it's a really nice day like it is today, I bike ride. Unfortunately, I don't ride in the rain, so I won't try to hide that. Uh, fair weather rider. For leisure activities, it's a little bit of everything, biking, cycling, driving. And uh, to SFU, coming from North Vancouver, it's about six buses there and back, so three buses each way. So that means I have to rely on transfers working out quickly to get here efficiently. Um, so that means every day I spend about 110 minutes commuting. Um, you don't have to tell me the number of things I could do in my spare time with that. Uh, I'm well aware and I could probably list 10 more. So if this referendum were successful, of course it's gonna benefit me. It's gonna make buses run more frequently, which means I'm not missing my buses on my four transfers a day and waiting a half hour for the next one. But this presentation isn't just about me, it's about students, it's about the experience that they have and how they're gonna shape their referendum. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the referendum and millennials, kind of making that connection. How are they gonna shape the referendum? How is the referendum gonna shape them? So first things first, we need to of course acknowledge that millennials are different. Uh, some might argue that's good, some might argue that's bad. Uh, it's a question of having different values, different preferences and different travel behaviors as well. So. One of the things we do know is that millennials are the most educated generation in history. That's quite an incredible statistic. And that then shapes their values and their preferences as well. So for example, millennials are far more likely to pay more to protect the environment. Um, so you can kind of see how this might influence their transportation mode choices, their support for the referendum, and so forth. 
So there's a recent article in Maclean's magazine. Uh, it was a few months ago. I don't know if any of you read it. It got shared around quite a bit. And it was called Young and Carless. And it essentially looked at data from a few different studies throughout North America and how there's this impending crisis for automotive manufacturers because younger generations are driving less. So I'm not too concerned right now in this presentation about the impending crisis for automotive manufacturers. But the trends are important for transportation going forward, especially in this region. Uh, you can see on that chart there, since the year 2000, every single year, the proportion of 17-year-olds uh, with their vehicle licenses in the US, similar trend in Canada though, has actually constantly decreased. It's down to almost 50% now. There's a few reasons for this. One uh, is simply <coughs> there's other modes of transit available or they at least prefer them. There was a study out of McGill that found that millennials are far more likely to take public transit far less likely to drive a vehicle than previous generations. They're also more willing to give up their cars than their cell phones. Um, these are really interesting things. We need to kind of understand why to figure out if these trends are going to continue indefinitely into the future or if this is just a little blip because this will shape the referendum. So there's three kind of key reasons. The first is, of course, the economy. Uh, millennials were hit harder than other generations with the recent recession. Fewer jobs available, youth unemployment's high. And most of the jobs that are available are temporary contract positions. There's a lot of uncertainty there, so they're delaying these large ticket purchases. The second reason, though, that's a little bit more long term and that won't change as an economy recovers is there's a lack of an emotional connection. So with that stat I gave you on the last slide that said a study found that millennials prefer to give up their uh, cars over their cell phones. Well, the running theory behind that is this lack of emotional connection. The baby boomers, they relied on vehicles as a way to kind of express their identity and as a way to meet with friends. Getting a new car gave you something to hang out around, something to talk about, a way to engage with others. Today, we have social media, we have text messaging, we have a variety of ways where people can get connected easily, so they don't rely on cars for the social interaction anymore. That's something that'll persist. The third is also living preferences. That is arguably the most important um, because that'll have major implications in Metro Vancouver as well. <coughs> so the more important aspect of the living preferences, I guess, is that there's actually a connection that millennials make about how their livability relates to public transit. So this was a major study that came out last year. It was a survey of millennials and their transportation preferences, and it found that two-thirds of millennials actually said access to high-quality transportation is one of their top three priorities when deciding, a uh, when deciding a place to live. That's huge, top three priorities. Maybe more interesting is that over half would actually consider moving to another city if it had better transportation options. So this gives a direct stake in Metro Vancouver as well going forward. If they're not gonna invest in, if we, sorry, aren't going to invest in critical infrastructure improvements, we might miss out on millennials staying here, the ones that are gonna be driving innovation and economic growth in the coming decades. Um, so there was also a 2014 mobility attitudes survey as well. Uh, got a little bit messed up on the slide there, so it's missing the quote. But essentially the quote said, unfortunately, that I'll read it out to you. It was that um, millennials are challenging the status quo of their suburban parents, and they're moving away from suburbs and choosing transit over a uh, private vehicle. And that's important. There's this shift happening underway where millennials are wanting to move into urban cities, places of density, and places with uh, walkable urban amenities around. These are things that are going to stay. And if we want to look at case studies of these university students, give us a good example. In Metro Vancouver, there's over 200,000 university students, most of all of which are millennials. So this is uh, over, essentially over 10% of the voting population in the coming ref referendum. UBC, 77% of students commute by transit. To put that in perspective, the Metro Vancouver average is 20%. So three out of every four students get to and from UBC uh, each day by transit. And the current system can't meet that demand. We see that there's about 2,000 pass-ups a day, give or take, um, along Broadway for UBC students. And 32% of students that are living off campus, they actually spend over 50 minutes each way commuting compared to a national average of 25 minutes. So. A uh, third of UBC students have commute times double that that is average across Canada. SFU, it's really no different. It's actually more extreme. 88% of undergraduates commute by transit. Many are enrolled in one of the three different campuses, two of three or all three, so Surrey, Vancouver, and Burnaby. That means in a given day, they might be relying on transit to get between the two or three of the campuses, and then might also be tackling on a part-time job on the side that evening where they also rely on transit. As we see again, the current system can't support that. 
There's waits of up to 30 minutes at Production Way Station and other connecting hubs, and the average commute of an SFU student is 47.4 minutes, which is also almost twice the national average. So there's a silver lining in this, and the silver lining is that it's translated into widespread support for the referendum from students. Through our advoca advocacy for the referendum, talking with students, it's very, very rare we come across someone that is against the referendum or planning to vote no. I think as a worst case scenario, they're open and they're gonna look at uh, different sources and kind of form their opinion. With that said though, that doesn't mean this is all great. We're gonna have 290,000 students casting to vote yes, um, and that would bring us close to the expected 400,000 votes needed to win the referendum. The reason for that is unfortunately, this is also the exact same demographic that doesn't like to vote. <laughs> so uh, the chart up there shows you uh, data from Statistics Canada. Um, it was the past four municipal elections, and you see that the 18 to 24 age group and the 20, uh, five to 34 age group all turn out at under 50% voter turnouts. You compare that to the older demographics and it's a completely different story. So for that reason, this issue isn't going to be one about getting yes votes, it's gonna be one about getting people to vote. Students are more likely to support the referendum, so the biggest issue is just simply getting their vote. It doesn't matter how much they support it if they're not actually gonna cast that ballot. Uh, slide is there. So for that reason, I think the issue that we're talking about today with students, with these 290,000 students living in the Lower Mainland, the issue isn't necessarily one of getting their support, it's an issue of registration and conversion on those votes. So there's a few students though, uh, sorry, a few reasons why students are also very unlikely to be registered, which makes this a really uphill battle compared to even political registration. One is age. So most students, they're not old, they weren't old enough at least in the last BC provincial election to vote. So they're not registered with elections BC. And this isn't like a normal vote where you can just simply go to, uh, to the, one of the polling stations and then register on site. You need to register in advance to be able to receive that ballot. The second reason is residents. A lot of university students in BC move from places like Ontario, for example. They're still a Canadian citizen, they would be eligible, but they haven't voted in a BC provincial election, so they're also not registered. They're not gonna get that ballot in the mail. And the third reason is a lack of trust or faith in the political system. One of the most commonly cited reasons for not voting is that um, millennials or younger generations, they feel that they either don't have anyone to vote for, it's not worth voting for, or that their vote won't matter. But I think that also provides an interesting opportunity for this referendum, and that's kind of why I have a little bit of cautious optimism in this. There's three main reasons why I think this is different and why I think we can hope that student turnout will be huge. Uh, one of them is that this is a long voting period. And so uh, in most studies they find that the reason for not voting is uh, younger generations say that they couldn't fit into their schedule, they're too busy, or they didn't have the time to go to a, a polling station. Uh, this isn't a one day vote though, this is a two and a half month vote. So it can work with almost any schedule. The second reason is that the ballots are cast by mail. There's been a lot of discussion around this. The people make the joke snail mail. They say this should be online. Um, one, it would be great if it was online, of course. That's kind of one of the theories for always trying to get political voter turnout up. But I think its greatest benefit is that it's by mail. There's no need for reminders. There's no need to incorporate this into your day. You're going to receive a ballot in the mail. That's gonna serve as your reminder. It's as simple as checking it off, dropping it in the mail again. And then the last reason is that politics, well, they haven't actually been in the media, politics haven't been separated <laughs> from this referendum, but the referendum is separated from politics. It's a vote on transportation upgrades. Students have, and millennials have, a direct stake in the outcome of this. The voting is on a much smaller scale, their vote will matter, and we don't need many votes to actually make the change happen. And if students do vote, they know that they're gonna benefit from this. So I think for that reason, we do have some reason to be optimistic in here, but I think the key takeaway is that this vote is about millennials and that they're gonna actually determine the outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much to our three speakers and thank you to all three of you for keeping almost bang on time. So we do have uh, uh, at least 20 minutes or so for questions. I know uh, Dr. Winters needs to step out just before one. Uh, questions and comments. Um, Ken has got the microphone, uh, so he can pass it to whoever would like to uh, speak first. <laughs> we'll at the back. Surprise, it's me. Um, this is a question for Ben. I'd love to hear your thoughts on an Alberta or outsider view of this vote as 
a policy mechanism or a mechanism to make policy decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of your frank opinion on that. Yeah. Well, I'll just be explicit. I cannot, as a representative of a charity uh, that has to be nonpartisan, I definitely do not have uh, any specific recommendations on one way of the vote or another, but I can't talk about the vote framework, which is that you know, if you go back to the BC HST referendum, that's the sort of model I have back in the back of my back of my mind, which is that these aren't necessarily the best ways to elicit opinions on facts, more of opinions on emotions. And it's difficult to, as someone who's trying to explain what the hidden benefits of transportation are, you know, the nature of a hidden benefit is, is that it's hidden and people don't think about these sorts of things. Uh, they think about the tax that they're going to be able to pay or going to have to pay. So fr from that perspective, talking about a vote on the tax when the, the benefits are a little bit more diffuse is, is, always hard to, is always hard to do. And you don't see the sort of referendum approach pretty much anywhere else in Canada. Uh, so that's my answer on that question, which is that these aren't necessarily the best mechanisms for, for determin determining the, the, the uh, broader social good. I have another question uh, from Twitter, and it is, um, where has this good data on health and congestion been packaged and successfully communicated? I'll take that one. So uh, on last Friday, if you're talking about the local data, last Friday, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health did a big release of their results from the My Health My Community survey that they've been working on for the past year. That's a really landmark study. A lot of times what you'll hear decision makers in the public is they don't want to hear data from some place in the US or some place in Europe. They want data from here. And that's what this has really provided. Um, for context. So that was released on Friday. There was an event last night at UBC as well. Um, and so there is various packages around that right now that are easily accessible for people. Any other questions from the floor over here? I just have a comment. Um, um, I'm a grade 12 student this year, oh, uh, graduating. and. My comment is just that when uh, in the last presentation about the uh, accessibility to universities through public transit, my comment is that I just, when I was selecting universities to apply for and to go to, the, um, the time it would take for me to get there through public transit really affected my decision. So like for that reason, I'm definitely going to be voting yes for this um, uh, in the referendum because I think for a lot of high school students, the outcome of this referendum will definitely affect where they choose to study and what they're going to do in their futures. Can I just pick up on that? You know, I think that's a, a thank you for coming, first of all. And I think that's just a fantastic um, story to get out there in the media in whatever way you can. Because if we think about who can't vote in these, not only who isn't registered, but who can't vote. So the youth who are gonna live here, I mean by youth, the high school students right now, they're gonna be here in 30 years. They're gonna be transit users. New immigrants to Canada don't have citizenship yet. They can't vote, okay? Those are the heaviest, amongst the heaviest users of transit right now. So it's about representing those voices who don't actually even have the right to vote right now in this, in this upcoming referendum and making sure that you consider that those are the people who we need to take care of in our society for sure. Keep in mind, thank you. Further questions for the panelists? Comments right here? I just wanted to ask, um, will this presentation be available as a podcast? And can you give the details of where we can access this so that we can share it with people to try and persuade them to vote yes? Actually, I'll take that question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is being recorded and webcast live at the moment. It'll also be put on the Carbon Talks YouTube channel, and um, that will be tweeted out on social media from Carbon Talks and Moving in a Livable Region. So that'll be available in about a week's time. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? I'll, I'll pose a question, if I may, just briefly, and to uh, Joshua. Do you or anyone else uh, have any estimates as to, you gave some figures of the total student population, at least the university student population, 
in the region, uh, what percentage of those would not be able to vote because of age or having recently moved to the province and therefore not um, uh, eligible to vote? Uh, I don't have a spe uh, specific number to provide, but it would be substantial, and that is definitely part of the issue. A lot of the students that we do talk to that are most passionate about voting, they are international students. Uh, they intend to maybe stay here indefinitely, but as of right now, they don't have the ability to cast a vote. Yeah. Um, they can't register to vote. Uh, I believe international students make up at least a quarter or so of sure. SFU's population. So um, it's an uphill battle, and it's, it's going to be difficult because even a lot of the Canadian residents and uh, students born in BC right now aren't registered. Um, so this is why, again, I think this is really a matter of getting just the registration going, even more so than just getting a yes vote going. And do you have to have registered prior to the ballot being put, uh, put March the 16th? Uh, no. So in order to receive their ballots in the first mail-out, this first two-week period, they had to be registered by, I believe, March 5th was the deadline. But the registration period will actually go up until May 15th. And as long as they have registered with Elections BC by May 15th, that still gives that two week uh, buffer period there before the, uh, the end, and they'll still receive a ballot in the mail and can still vote. Can I pick up on that? So one of the things to point out also is that um, students need to have been in BC for six months. So if they did come here in September from a different province, they've been here now for six months and are eligible to register. The other hurdle that you hear is that students move a lot, and so it's about making sure that your correct address is online with Elections BC. So I've been... Um, making sure people know they're going to electionsbc.bc.ca and that it takes about three minutes to update your address. I had to do it as well. Um, and you just need your social insurance number or your driver's license number to make sure that happens. So it's not a huge process, but it is a huge barrier. Some of the most effective student targeted campaigns that I've seen are people helping with uh, uh, registration processes. So having an iPad on hand, making sure that people can register there while you're talking to them. Um, because that's that's the hurdle, or inviting people in their classes to take those two minutes to just log on to their cell phones um, or their laptops and make sure that they're registered in that moment before that moment passes. Uh, yeah, that's an important thing too. I'll just add on to is the uh, address verification and updating that. There's no harm going through filling it out and putting in your current address, even if that may be the one on file. But there's no accurate way to really check that. So just to do it, especially for younger students, because they might have moved out of their parents' houses. NBC in the past few years, and therefore the ballot might be sent to the previous household, for example. So it's important to just go through that process again to at least update your information, even if it may already be correct. But if you have any lack of 100% certainty, to go forward and do that. OK, uh, another question here. Hi, I was wondering if each of you could speak a bit on what we are looking at if there's a no vote and what what will happen next and what are the other alternatives that might be considered after if there's a no vote? Should we do this in order? Sure. Um, the, the question just becomes, at least on the transit side, my understanding is that the plan's going to go ahead one way. The, the specific plan is going to go ahead. Exactly how you pay for it is just a matter of, I might be wrong, or it's going to cut back on some of the other projects. But other other options are property taxes, um, and property taxes are generally a, a fairly efficient way of paying for, for services. But others, other taxes, such as increasing personal income taxes or corporate income taxes, we get to see CT House that have shown that those kinds of taxes are a far more economically damaging way of of, uh, of financing f uh, future investment. So if they're going to go ahead with the same same plan, uh, uh, it, it really, then whether it's going to have a, a broader economic cost is going to depend on what other taxes they choose to live. So my understanding is that uh, pieces of the plan will go ahead. The Patillo Bridge is deemed unsafe, and so it will become a safe bridge. And the money's going to come from somewhere. So if this tax doesn't go through, the only other way I understand to raise funds is by another tax, which is um, this one, the sales tax that they initiated was deemed to be the most equitable approach to taxes and sharing the cost with the good, including taxing visitors from afar. Property taxes are not anything that um, bodes well for 
nobody likes a property tax increase as well. Um, students or youth may say that doesn't affect me, I'm not a homeowner. It affects the cost of your rent. It all gets pushes, pushed forward. So, you know, the, pl the other options to fund pieces of this will not be better than the current sales tax in my opinion and in the assessment of many think tanks, including the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, um, which wrote a great blog about the options available. And um, it won't be a cohesive plan with a regional focus. So certain municipalities or certain parts of the puzzle may get put into place, but that doesn't connect people so that your regional commutes will be 20 to 30 minutes less if pieces of the puzzle are missing. Um. After those two comments, I don't have too much I could add that would provide much substance to the discussion. Um, I think the key thing that we've come across, at least talking to students, is the lack of understanding that um, if this fails, well, one, there's of course the chance we go through this at, in four years again and go through whole referendum process. But the more important thing is that things will not carry on with, as usual. Um, their buses will not stay at the same capacity. Things will actually get worse. We're talking about not bringing in any new sources of funding, even though demand will actually increase. So it's actually gonna be a little bit worse than kind of what status quo is right now. So that's an important thing to communicate. And uh, as they said, though, my understanding as well is that it will just be kind of pieced together. A few aspects will go forward, likely through property tax, which is another huge way you can kind of push the no side as well to consider a yes vote. Uh, if we do it with a property tax, you're not, you're not having the benefit of voting on this clear transportation plan where you know how much you're going to pay and what exactly that is going to get you. It's just going to be a general property tax increase that then goes to fund transportation and you have that lack of visibility to it. Okay, I have another question coming from Twitter, um, interesting one. What constitutes a hidden benefit of transportation? Oh, sure. Uh, so let's let's take a few examples. Uh, one is if you're a restaurant owner or you want to start up a restaurant, I've got this great idea for a specialty oyster and beer bar or something like that. Uh, it, but if that's only going to really cater to one in ten thousand people in the Metro Vancouver region, that's going to mean that if I if I'm going to set up in downtown Vancouver, I need to be able to draw people from Surrey, from West Vancouver. Burnaby. If those people can't get downtown, I'm not able. I'm not able to open my restaurant. Learning in person is another another classic benefit. Why do we even have this university? Why do we have a campus? The, the benefit of being able to learn in person, students being able to come here, learn from from professors face to face. That. Is, a, is, is one of the hidden economic benefits of, of transportation infrastructure. And the very nature of, the, of something that's hidden is hard, hard to quantify. It's relatively easy uh, to at least quantify the visible economic cost of congestion. That's how much longer you take in traffic versus how long it should take. So that's, those are the numbers that have been tossed around so far. And that's been the, the basis of the cost-benefit analysis that the Mayor's Council has presented to the public. But what the CDA Institute study has done and what other countries around the world are doing especially in the United Kingdom, in order to justify their, their transportation infrastructure investment is basing their cost-benefit analysis on these hidden economic benefits. Because if you're not doing your, your cost-benefit analysis to include all the real benefits, you're, 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 you're making the case with one hand tied behind your back. You need to be, think, be able to think about all, you know, these few examples, a number of examples applied over and over and over across the region of learning in person, being able to open a restaurant, uh, being able to find, a new, uh, find a, new, uh, a new job that suits your needs and your employer's needs. All these are wider economic benefits that up until now no one's been t thinking about. Can I just take one stab at that? I try and find a way to make this relatable to the individual. So especially coming from health, you know, in Canada, of course, that's um, the healthcare costs aren't necessarily something that we feel. But when I think about uh, the physical activity benefits of transportation, ways that this incorporates physical activity into your daily life, well, maybe that means that you don't need to pay for that gym membership. So if there are facilities that mean that you feel safe walking and cycling in your neighborhoods, which are part of this plan as well, not the big ticket items, but in the plan as well, that mean that you can take transit and get those nine, 10 minutes of physical activity, that run for the bus in there, maybe that means that you don't have some of those other costs related in your life as well that you have to take on. Questions from the floor? Yes, 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something to the response to that Twitter comment that really, separate from the referendum, just talking about transportation and uh, non-financial benefits. Uh, for someone like me, you don't necessarily want to get into the dollars and cents. Um, <clears throat> you want to get into the um, non-financial benefits. So I'm a single dad. Um, if I can pick up my child at 5.30 instead of 6, yeah. yes, I may save 30 minutes worth of daycare cost, but there's also 30 minutes more a day I get to spend with my son. So, you know, it's those little things. If you're a student, um, there's a financial benefit of having a job, yes, but if you can only get to work at 6.30 p.m. after classes versus getting to work at 6 p.m. after classes, maybe there's more in different jobs you can apply to. So there's that, there's that non-financial piece to an improved transportation infrastructure that's, I think, important to anyone's sense of uh, well-being. Thank you. Well, said a doctor would just need to leave right now, uh, but we can take uh, just a couple more comments or questions if there are any from the audience at the back there. And then one, yeah. Um, this is just a really quick comment, but um, one of my classmates in urban studies at SFU has been involved in this referendum and in the yes side and has been involved in encouraging any students who cannot vote to convince one or two other people who can vote to vote for them. Um, and I think this is an idea that if, if people were able to get out there and do that in a referendum where every vote will count, that that's a really important idea. Yeah, that was a great comment. And I think that uh, I was expecting someone to ask something like, well, how can we get people to vote then? And I was going to say, well, that's actually, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, there's a reason why we've been struggling for years to get younger generations to vote in elections. There's no easy answer. Um, but I think a huge component of it's going to be this social component, social influence, and kind of a little bit of pressure as well. This kind of uh, expectation that you're going to fulfill your, uh, your role as a citizen and actually cast a ballot in a decision that's going to make a major impact on your future. So I think that's a great initiative, and I think everyone should be trying to do that because that can go a long way in a vote that's especially so local in just Metro Vancouver with only so many votes being cast. Okay, we'll take one final question, and you had your hand up. It's more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to pick up on something I think it's Ben said that really resonated for me, which is that... Um, Improving transportation will benefit people throughout the region, and in particular, say in Burnaby, uh, which some people feel is well served by public transportation, you and Burnaby will benefit from improved public transportation in Surrey, in that uh, that will bring visitors, it will increase visits, it will bring potential customers into Burnaby. I think that's a very, very important point because. One of the forces that's fueling the no vote is what I call parochialism, which is that each district is being played off against the other and saying, well, why is UBC going to get that underground subway that's so expensive? What does that do for us? Uh, so I think, Ben, that's a very important point that needs to be repeated and reiterated in many different fora. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say the econo-nerd approach to saying that is that it's an externality. And when you have an externality, what that means is you should have some sort of government support or government tax on that. When you're talking about pollution, the approach is to have a tax on that pollution. Pretty standard in economics. All pretty much 99.99% .99 of economists would say, yeah, that's a good idea. The same applies when you're talking about a positive externality. When what I do has a, po has a positive effect on others, if I'm able to tra travel somewhere, I'm able to have a positive effect on someone else, that means there's a case for public support. Not necessarily having that person need to pay full fare on transit or a full, a, full, a full congestion charge. It gets to the case for a broader uh, broader system of public finance for that infrastructure. Okay. Um, well, it's, I think, 1 o'clock. And uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to our speakers, Dr. Megan Winters, who had to step out to get back to a hiring board, uh, to Joshua, uh, and uh, to Dr. Dawkins uh, for his presentations. It's been a really, very informative panel. I think it's also, we've had a nice range of presentations from an economics policy analysis, uh, a public health epidemiology analysis, and what I might call a uh, voter psychology, and, <laughs> and 
and lifestyle analysis, which is probably where most people as individuals come from, but it's great to put those perspectives together. And thank you very much to the audience for uh, all your comments and questions. So uh, you can watch this online, or more importantly, encourage other people who have questions and want to pick up on some of these ideas in about a week's time at Carbon Talks. Uh, it'll be an online uh, uh, presentation. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>